Okay. In the next video, we're going to use Snell's law to make a precise description of how a thin lens can collect light from an object and focus that light into an image. So we'll use math in the next video. In this video, we're just looking at things qualitatively. Uh, we know that Snell's law allows us to calculate the angle that a refracted ray makes with the boundary between two media. Uh, in this video, like I said, we don't need to use numbers. We'll take a look at ray tracing, almost exactly the way it's, it's presented in your book. And let's start by examining how, uh, how a converging lens works, just conceptually. A converging lens is just a piece of glass, although it doesn't really have to be glass. Uh, usually, we use glass lenses to focus visible light, but you could also, for instance, use a piece of ice to focus infrared radiation. But the only requirement for a converging lens is that it's thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. I'm going to exaggerate the lens as far as its curvature. Most lenses are thinner than this. Later, well, we will look at the radii of curvature of the two faces. You can think of this side of the lens as being part of a larger circle. There's a particular radius associated with that circle. Same thing for the other side of the lens. And we'll see that if we know the index of refraction of this material and we know the two radii of curvature, we could actually calculate a number that describes the, the so-called power of the lens. We're gonna talk about focal length, but if you look at the prescriptions or the prescription for your corrective lenses, you may see the power listed in diopt uh, diopters, which is something we'll talk about in the next chapter, chapter 35, which is about optical instruments. Okay, well, some of you may have played around with a magnifying glass as kids. Maybe you use the light from the sun to uh, focus, or you use the lens to focus sunlight down to a point. You could use that point to, I don't know, burn a dot into a piece of wood, maybe even trace out your name, or uh, torch ants with it. I don't know what kind of a sick individual would do that, but <clears throat> um, so if, if you've ever d played around with magnifying glass in the sun, you're familiar with this behavior. Because the sun is so far away, and let me give you a quick sketch so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, if this was the sun, and this was planet Earth. And here's you on the Earth. You could imagine a ray coming from the bottom of the sun to your eyeball and from the top of the sun to your eyeball. And these two rays are definitely not parallel. In actuality, uh, this picture is not at all to scale. If let me see if I can uh, estimate if, if this was actually the sun, or if the, suppose this is the sun. Uh, planet Earth, truthfully, would not even be on this piece of paper. It would be off the page, uh, out of this room, out the window, and clear across the street easily. So this the solar system is vast. But to give you some sense of what I'm getting at here, I will redraw those two rays from the top of the sun to planet Earth and the bottom of the sun to planet Earth. These two rays are still not parallel. There's an, an obvious angle between them, but maybe you're starting to get a sense that if we took planet Earth here and dragged it even farther away, these rays would become more and more parallel. So you can assume that any two rays reaching a spot on planet Earth are basically parallel. So I will draw back in this first diagram a series of rays, all of which are assumed to come from the sun. And truthfully, it doesn't have to be the sun, it could be any other object that's very far away. This could be light from a distant star like Betelgeuse. Poor Betelgeuse, it was up every night this winter in the constellation or in the asterism that we call Orion. But now by the time nine o'clock rolls around, it's, it's almost already set beneath the Eastern horizon. So we've got new stars coming into view. 
if you've taken astronomy or if you've done any observing, summer is kind of boring compared to winter. A lot of the interesting stuff is up in the winter. Okay, so it's just a fact that, or it's an experimental fact, it's something you could observe that these rays uh, are bent by the lens. And they, in fact, will be converged by the lens. Each of them is bent twice, once at the front face, once at the back face of the lens. So you get two refractions and they all seem to be focused at a single point. Now, a real lens does not perfectly focus all of these rays at a single point. That's the ideal. You'd like to have a lens that could do that. That would allow you to produce really sharp images um, but they're they're going to more or less focus at the same point. In fact, the closer you get to the edges, uh, the farther these rays actually land from what we would call the focal point. Rays towards the center of the lens are focused a little better than rays at the edge, and that that lack of focusing from rays at the edge is a type of aberration. It's just an imperfection. I shouldn't say an imperfection because that makes it sound like it's got. Um, scratches in the lens or the manufacturing defects. It's just a property of this type of lens. It doesn't behave exactly the way we would like. And let's look now at how the converging lens does this. It's really simple. All you have to remember is that rule about, if I go back to Snell's law, theta two is the arc sine. You take the ratio, what was it? Theta n1, excuse me, n1 over n2 sine of theta one. Anytime your index of refraction is less than n1, uh, on the outgoing side, if this number is lower than this one, then we've got a number greater than one, and that's gonna take theta one and make it bigger for theta two. So the rule is, if light is passing into a medium where it travels faster, it's going to bend away from the normal. This number will be bigger than this number. If it's traveling into a material where it travels slower, then N2 would be greater than N1. This is a ratio less than one. Theta two comes out less than theta one. That means that it will bend towards the normal. So to summarize, if the light speeds up, it bends away from the normal. If it slows down, it bends towards the normal. Maybe you can already see that here, but let's, Make this a little bigger. Here's my converging lens. And I'm just gonna go three rays so that this is quick. Um, the first ray will come in at normal incidence. Do you see how it's already perpendicular to, uh, to the curve of the lens? And when we say perpendicular, normally we're talking about two lines when we say that they're perpendicular. So we're really talking about the tangent line. If I draw the line tangent to the lens at the point of contact with the ray, then I can see already that this ray is perpendicular to the tangent line. That means theta one is zero. Theta two will also be zero. And this ray just continues on undeflected. And the same thing will happen on the opposite face. face. That's important to recognize immediately that uh, a lens, uh, a lens, excuse me, a ray striking a lens at normal incidence will just continue on undeflected. I'll do another ray up here. And if we want to see what happens to this ray, first thing we'll have to do is draw the normal. So uh, I'm not gonna use a protractor, I'll just eyeball this. I can imagine the tangent line or draw it. Let me draw the tangent line. It's not really necessary. That makes it easier for me to draw a normal line which is perpendicular to the tangent line. This dotted line is the line normal to the lens at this point of contact with the ray. And now I, I think about Snell's law. This would be theta one. Out here in the air, the index of refraction is basically one. In here inside the glass, it's something like 1.5. The index of refraction is going up. That means that the wave is slowing down, which implies that it's going to bend towards the normal. Anytime your wave slows down, the rays will bend towards the normal. I'm not gonna 
get out my calculator and figure out what the angle would be in terms of theta one. This is just qualitative. So instead of continuing on in the direction that it was going, the ray is going to bend toward the normal. This should be good enough. So there's one refraction already at the first face of the lens. Now we have to repeat that process over here. It's going to refract again when it exits the lens. I will draw a tangent line at the point of contact, which makes it easier to see the normal. Okay, this time the wave is moving into a region with a lower index of refraction. That means that the wave will speed up, which tells us that the wave is going to bend, or the ray will bend away from the normal. Instead of continuing on in this direction, this ray will bend again, this time away from the normal. So I will draw something like this. And there you have it. We already see why this lens converges the rays. Let me repeat the process over here. And this might be interesting. I'm not even going to try to pick a point that's, um, well, I take that back. I was going to pick on purpose a point that's a different distance from the so-called optical axis, like a point way down here or here, and check to see that it, that it really does go through the same point. But that would only work. My diagram would only come out correct if I had used a protractor in Snell's law. I think I'll do that in another video. For now, I'm just going to cheat and force the ray to pass to the same point. I won't even bother with the normal lines, just being qualitative here. There's one refraction at the front face and a second refraction at the outgoing face. And the idea is, if I had actually uh, performed this refraction with a protractor using the index of refraction, and I repeated that process for a dozen rays, regardless of the exact curvature here. So I, I've just drawn an arbitrary shape that's thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. It doesn't actually have to be a segment or a section of a circle and a section of a circle. This could be some arbitrary curve as long as it's thicker in the middle than it is at the edges, and we use Snell's law to figure out what all these angles are, you would actually find that, that these lenses, um, not the lenses, these rays would more or less converge to a single point. And this is called the focal point. Focal point. It's, it's that bright dot that you saw on the ant's body. Excuse me, not the ant's body, that's, that's twisted. It's the bright spot that you saw on the concrete or a piece of wood when you successfully focused the light from the sun. And that little extremely bright dot of light that you uh, saw if you did play with magnifying glasses as a kid, that's actually an image of the sun. You're taking all of the, the light from the sun that actually passes through this lens and focusing it to an image. And you know the, the sun's bright enough if you just look at it directly that's, uh, that's your eyeball focusing whatever light is passing through your pupil. It's focusing all of that light to a point on your retina. That's already bright enough. Imagine if you collected, if you had a magnifying glass this big. This is way bigger than your pupil. Your, your pupil something like that. Imagine collecting all this light and gathering it down to a, a single point. That would be very intense. You're taking all that power, focusing it on a very small area, which is a large, very large intensity. Large power, small area, very intense. Okay, so you must know this term. The focal point is the place where all the rays are converged by a converging lens if the incoming light consists of parallel rays. That's important. These rays have to be parallel in order for you to call this the focal point. And another term you should know is the distance between the center of the lens. Here's the center of the lens. Here's the focal point. The distance from the center of the lens to the focal point is called the focal length. And we usually just denote that with the letter F. So focal length. Let's repeat this process now with 
a different type of lens. And I want to make an amendment to a statement I just made a minute ago. I said that for an arbitrary curve here, you would you would still get light focusing at a single point. I'm sure there are limits to how true that statement is. You know, I couldn't just imagine a, a lens like this and expect this to focus light to, to a point. It probably has to be somewhat circular or parabolic. If you want to investigate that further, go major in uh, optics or get a degree in optics. That's like a, that's a thing. <clears throat> a diverging lens. Well, if a converging, converging lens is thicker in the middle than it is at the edges, you might guess that a diverging lens is thinner in the middle. And these are very common as well. I'm quite certain that you can draw a better diverging lens than this. I'm quite certain I can draw a better diverging lens than this. If you wear glasses, four eyes. No, if you wear glasses and you're nearsighted like I am, or if you want to use the fancy term, you would say you're myopic. Uh, myopic in the literal sense. You're not, I'm not saying you're nearsighted about your life. You know, you couldn't see disaster coming, didn't plan ahead for your future. I mean, literally nearsighted. If you look at the lenses of your glasses, well, I was about to show you the lenses of my glasses, but I don't want you to see the nose pads. Oh, those are gross. Well, you'll see that the lenses in your glasses are thinner in the middle. They're di diverging lenses if you're nearsighted like I am. Literally nearsighted. You could repeat this process of uh, applying Snell's law qualitatively. Here's a ray that strikes normally at the middle of the lens. It's undeflected. But when I look at this ray, and this time I'm not going to bother drawing the tangent line. I will just visualize the normal to the lens at that point. And again, we're going from air into glass. The wave slows down. We would expect it to bend towards the normal. So instead of continuing on in the direction it was going, it's going to bend towards the normal. And you already see how this diverging lens does indeed diverge rays. There's going to be a second refraction at this surface. Let me draw the normal line again. And instead of this ray continuing on as it would, now it's going from a region of higher index of refraction to an index of lower in, to a region of lower index of refraction. That means that the, or that's equivalent to saying that the ray will speed up. Anytime the wave speeds up, the ray is going to bend away from the normal. Okay. Diverging lens. Let me repeat that with one more ray here. The idea is you could draw any number of rays and see this behavior. This lens will diverge a bundle of incoming parallel rays. And you may wonder, is there a focal length for this lens? Obviously, the light's not being converged to any one point. So if there is a focal point, it has a different significance. There is. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't draw this very well, but to, to an eyeball over here, just imagine your eyeball is so large in this drawing that is collecting all these rays. As far as your eye is concerned, this ray came from somewhere back here. You, you know, your brain is not aware of the fact. There I go again, talking about your brain as if it's different from you. Now really your brain is aware of the fact because you're taking 3C and you're learning about this, but um, your non-physics brain doesn't know the difference. You, you perceive this ray as if it's coming from back here. So let me, extend this ray backwards with the dotted line. And I'm going to do the same thing with this ray. Oh, check that out. I got lucky. It actually does almost go to the same point. I'm going to cheat a little bit. This didn't come out perfect, but if you repeated this process with any number of rays being diverged by the lens and you extended all of them backwards, if you had used Snell's law, precisely with a calculator and used a protractor to draw this, you would find that all these rays do appear to diverge from a single point. 
And you know what? I challenge at least one of you to actually do this. Some of you are better with uh, pen and paper than me. You've got time. You're stuck at home. You're probably not going to work. You're not socializing because your friends are all coughing and gross. Um, make one of these diagrams. And like I said, it doesn't actually matter that you get this shape perfectly circular. Try to make it smoother, but pick a single value for this index of refraction, 1.5 and go with n equals one here. And each time you draw a ray to the lens, carefully draw the normal line with your protractor um, and then measure this angle theta one. Use Snell's law in your calculator. Hey, you could always uh, automate things, write a little program or use Excel um, so that you can just type in theta one and, and Excel will spit out theta two. Once you know what theta two is, you can use your protractor to carefully draw the refracted ray and repeat that process at the second phase. Yeah, I'm already realizing this is gonna take a while. So if anybody does do it, you're an overachiever, but I would really appreciate it. I, I will post your beautiful drawing on Canvas and save it for posterity. I'll show it to future, to future semesters. Maybe I'll even put it on my refrigerator. Um, but yeah, but if you do that, you should, you should find, if you were careful with your protractor, you should find that these rays do indeed appear to be diverging from one point. That's kind of remarkable that, that the lens has that property. And if you can make that work on paper, then it should work with an actual piece of glass, if indeed light waves behave the way we're describing them. So this distance from where the, uh, from where the rays appear to be diverging from, the distance from there to the center of the lens, just like before is called the focal length. And we still use the letter F and uh, don't quote me on this. We'll come back to this, but I believe for a diverging lens, you consider this number to be a negative number because um, it makes things work out correctly in the equations that we'll be using. Now this is really a topic for the next chapter, chapter 35, which discusses optical instruments, but I want to give you some, uh, or a brief look at some of the uses for lenses. Here's a human eyeball, and you may be thinking, why did you make it so oblong? Why does it look like an egg practically? I'm exaggerating uh, an actual feature of many human eyeballs, my own included. Uh, well, I don't know this for certain, but because uh, there's more than one reason that you could be nearsighted. It could be a uh, a uh, misshapen lens or imperfectly shaped lens or the front of your cornea could have the incorrect curvature. But I think often your eyeball is just a little long. Did you know that if you're nearsighted, you probably have slightly long eyeballs. And as a result, if you're looking at something far away, I'm gonna pretend that this is so far away that the rays coming in are practically parallel, although that's not really necessary. Uh, let me just draw two representative rays from the top of this tree, which pass through your pupil. I drew this pupil way too big, sorry. But also within the eye, I've drawn the lens. Isn't that amazing? There's, there's something in your eyeball like glass that, that acts as a lens. I think as you get older, it gets thicker and thicker and it, it becomes harder to squish. Believe it or not, you have muscles around the lens that can squeeze it and make it get a little fatter, which changes its focal length, and that allows you to focus on things at different distances. But these rays are supposed to, uh, supposed to be bent, first of all, by the surface of your eyeball. You may not have been aware that a lot of the focusing, I think more than half of the focusing happens at the surface of your eyeball, and then they are further focused by the lens itself. They're supposed to to uh, converge at a point at the very back of your eye called the retina. And then of course you've got light sensitive cells here that respond to that light energy. And I don't know, there's some gross tissue back here that leads to your brain. I think there's a word for, what is it, ganglia? Ugh. And uh, I read once when I was a psychology major back in the dark ages, I don't normally admit that, but some of your visual processing actually happens here before it even gets to your brain. So arguably your brain extends into your orbital cavities. Part of your brain is like outside 
what you would normally think of as your brain. Okay, if your eyeballs are too long, then these rays may converge a little too early, too soon. They're converging here. And that means that the image formed on your retina will be out of focus. So this poor person is going to see a real blurry image of the tree. How could you correct this? Well, if you could make these rays spread out a little more, then maybe the focusing done by the front of your cornea and the lens would be just enough to get it to form an image on the back. So the idea is to insert a diverging lens in between the object, in this case, the tree that you're looking at, and your eyeball. So here's your long eyeball. This eye's just getting more and more deformed. And I'll do the same thing, but this time, <clears throat> my, my two rays from the top of the tree, they're gonna spread out a little bit. This is, this is gonna work because they're not even going at the eyeball. Let me try this again. This, this ray is doing okay. Let me do another one right here. This ray will be spread out just a little bit, and this ray will be spread out just a little bit. See how they're perhaps entering with a greater angle between them than they were here? It's not a great diagram, but now the focusing may be just right so that the rays converge at a point on the retina instead of before the retina. And now this person can clearly see the top of the tree repeat the argument all the way down the tree. They can produce uh, a clear image of the tree at large on the retina. So this is how you correct myopia, nearsightedness. You put a diverging lens in front of the eyeball. If you're nearsighted, take your glasses off right now. Check those lenses. You'll find that they're thinner in the middle. I'll come back with another video where we actually use numbers and mathematics to um, to explain this, this process. In fact, no, I just realized we're not done here. The other main thing we need to do in this video is talk about ray tracing. And I think I'll do that in a separate video. We'll keep this video short. The next video will be an introductory look at ray tracing. And after that, we'll dive into making actual calculations.